Hi, my name is Milad Kazarunyan, and I'll be talking about SimTyper, our new system for inferring type annotations in Ruby programs. We'll start by introducing our running example, which is this method timestamp.create, which we took from TZ Info, one of the benchmarks we use. And we've added some ellipses to elide some of the unimportant details here, but basically given a year, month, and day, this method computes a timestamp. So let's break this down. The first three lines here perform some basic dynamic checks on the types of the inputs and raise an error in the case that any of the inputs are non-integers. The subsequent lines perform some basic arithmetic to compute Unix time. And the low-level details aren't important here, but all we need to note is that all three parameters are used in arithmetic expressions. And finally, we take the value that was computed and we use it to create and return a new timestamp from this method. And our goal is to automatically generate a type annotation for methods like create. And crucially, we want those annotations to actually be usable, meaning useful for the programmer. So in this case, we want to generate the type annotation that says the method takes three numbers and returns a timestamp, because this is the annotation that the developers wrote down. So why would we want to pursue a goal like this? Well, types are a universal form of documentation, and what's more, Ruby 3 recently introduced syntax for writing type annotations, which means it'd be useful to have a system for generating them. And on top of this, type annotations can serve as the basis for other kinds of program analysis, like code completion for IDEs. Now, the traditional solution to this problem is to use standard constraint-based type inference. But a key challenge here is that the inferred types are often what we call overly general making them hard to read and less useful to the programmer. And we'll see an example of this. Now, recent work implemented a system called InferDL that complements constraints with heuristic rules. And while this helps, heuristics can often fail to infer usable types. And we could always write new heuristic rules, but this process is time consuming and may not generalize to new programs. So we built the system SimTyper, which incorporates a novel machine learning based approach, which we call type equality prediction. And this works by using what we call a deep similarity or deep sim neural network to predict when two arguments or returns have the same type. So given two arguments or two returns, the network produces a similarity score in the range zero to one. And how the type equality prediction algorithm looks at a high level, is we'll first use constraints and heuristics to infer as many usable type annotations as possible. Then we use the deep sim network to compare positions with overly general types to positions with usable types. And for any positions with high scores, we guess the usable type in place of the overly general type. And if that guess is consistent with the constraints, then we use the usable type as our new solution. So let's return to our example. And we'll start with standard constraint-based inference. Now, the first thing we do is assign type variables for the unknown types in our program. So in this case, we assign alpha, beta, and gamma for the input types, and delta for the output type from the method. Next, we generate type constraints. And we'll use constraints of the form x less than or equal to y, which means that x must be a subtype of y or equivalently, we say x is a lower bound on y and y is an upper bound on x. And here's our first constraint. Notice we call the method kind of on the parameter year. So we generate a structural type constraint on alpha, the type for year. And the structural type says that alpha must have a method called kind of defined, and it gives the type for that method. In this case, it takes a class as an input and we don't know its output type, so we generate a fresh type variable, epsilon, for its output type. Next, month and day are used in nearly identical expressions, so we generate very similar constraints on beta and gamma, the types for those parameters. Next, notice that we call the greater than method on the parameter month. So we generate the constraint on beta, which says that it must have a greater than method defined that takes a number as input, and we don't know the output type of that method. And we generate similar constraints on the other parameter type variables. So alpha must have subtraction and division methods defined, and gamma and beta must have plus methods defined. 
And finally, because we return a timestamp, we generate the constraint that says that timestamp is lower bound on delta, the return type for our method. At this point, we would typically perform constraint resolution, which applies a series of constraint rewriting rules like transitive closure. But this example is so simple, there's actually nothing to do here. You can see the paper for more details on constraint resolution. Finally, we perform solution extraction. For arguments, we take the intersection of upper bounds on that argument's type for the solution, and for returns, we take the union of lower bounds on the return type. And here's the four solutions we end up with in this case. For alpha, beta, and gamma, we end up with these structural type solutions which tell us the methods that those parameters must define. And for delta, we end up with the solution timestamp. Now notice the first three solutions here are verbose, complex, and difficult to read, making them less useful to the programmer. And in fact, only one solution, the solution for delta, actually matches the developer provided annotation. So our goal is to generate more usable type annotations that more precisely reflect programmer intent. Now, recent work implemented InferDL, a system that complements constraint solving with a series of heuristic rules aimed at inferring more usable types. For instance, one heuristic rule they define is called struct to nominal, which converts structural types to nominal types. And at a high level, this rule looks up which classes define the structural types methods, and if that number of classes is small, defined as less than 10, then they guess the union of nominal types for those classes. So in this case, it turns out that only the numeric classes define all of the methods kind of, subtraction, and division, which are exactly the set of methods appearing in alpha's structural type. Which means we can replace alpha's solution with the type number, after ensuring that this type is consistent with constraints. So we've come up with a better solution for alpha. Unfortunately, it turns out that more than 10 classes define the methods in beta and gamma structural type, which means this heuristic rule does not apply in these cases, and we're stuck with these clunky structural types. So heuristics are useful, but they can sometimes fail to infer usable types, like they did for the parameters month and day. And while we could always write more heuristic rules to handle cases like these, this process is time consuming, and these new rules may not generalize to new cases in new programs. So we want a type system that generalizes to new programs. We want it to incorporate both natural language and program information, since we found both of these provide strong hints as to the types of values. And we want the type system to be sound. And our solution is to use type equality prediction with SimTyper. So back to our example, recall that constraints and heuristics inferred usable types for the parameter year and for the return type of our method. And now notice that there are strong similarities among the parameters year, month, and day. First of all, they're closely related words in English. And second of all, they're all used in very similar contexts in this method. First in nearly identical dynamic checks, and then in basic arithmetic expressions. And SimTyper uses what we call the deep similarity or deep sim network to capture those similarities. So here's the deep sim network at a high level. On the left, we see the inputs to the network. Each parameter gets its own input. And the input is really the method source code with special markers indicating positions of the relevant argument. So for example, for the parameter year, we mark all the positions in which year occurs in the methods definitions. We then run those inputs through the encoder stage of our network, which takes each parameter and encodes it into a single fixed dimensional vector that reflects both the name and program context in which the parameters occur. And we discuss the encoder more in our paper. Finally, we take the vectors that were produced by our encoder and we run pairs of them through our trained similarity function, which computes a similarity score between zero and one. Scores closer to one indicate the network's belief that two inputs have the same type, and scores closer to zero indicate the belief that they have different types. In this case, we get three similarity scores all above 0.8, suggesting the network's belief that these inputs all have the same type. So with these outputs from the DeepSim network, because we got a high similarity score of about 0.98 between year and month, we guess year's solution, which is number, for the parameter month. 
This guess turns out to be consistent with the set of constraints, so the solution number is used for the parameter month. Similarly, because we got a high similarity score of about 0.9 between month and day, we guess the solution number for day. Because this is consistent with the constraints, we use the solution number for the parameter day. And putting this all together, through a combination of constraints, heuristics, and type equality prediction, we inferred the type that matches exactly the developer-written annotation. Now we evaluated SimTyper by using it to infer types for eight Ruby programs, all of which had existing type annotations to compare against. And I'll note that some of these annotations came from non-type-checked documentation. Four of these benchmarks were previously used as inferred DL benchmarks, and four were new benchmarks. And we placed the inferred types into three categories. Match, in which inferred types matched the programmer written annotations. Match up to parameter, so for example if SimTyper inferred array number instead of the original type which was array string. And the different category for cases where the inferred type did not match the original type. And here's our key high-level results. We ran some typer under four configurations shown on the x-axis here. C means we used constraints, H means we used heuristics, and D means we used the DeepSim network. Notably, we found we could infer the most matching type annotations under the CHD configuration, which combines all three approaches. Under this configuration, we inferred 69% more matching type annotations than the constraint configuration alone. What's also notable is under the CD configuration, which uses constraints and the DeepSim network, we inferred 19% more matching type annotations than the CH configuration, which uses heuristics, suggesting that the DeepSim network is an effective approach to inferring usable type annotations. Now, there was a notable breakdown here when we looked at the different benchmark groups. So for the inferred DL benchmarks, it turned out that CH, the heuristic configuration, inferred 7% more matching types than CD, the DeepSim configuration. On the other hand, for the new benchmarks, CD inferred 44% more matching types than CH. The reason for this discrepancy is the heuristics were actually developed while implying inferred DL to the left group of benchmarks. And this highlights both the strength and the weakness of heuristic rules. Heuristics perform well on their initial target programs, but they may not generalize to new programs. On the other hand, we hope we've shown that the DeepSim network can be effective at generalizing. We also measured the precision and recall of the various configurations, where precision is measured as the number of inferred matches divided by the total number of inferred types, and recall is measured as the number of inferred matches divided by all positions, whether or not SimTyper inferred a type. And there's some interesting trade-offs among the configurations here, and we discuss them more in the paper. But most notably, the CHD configuration scored highest on both precision and recall, once again suggesting that it's an effective approach to inferring usable types. We suggest you check out the paper for many of the details we've left out here. For example, we provide a more detailed discussion of our implementation of SimTyper, including our use of a pre-trained existing natural and programming languages model called CodeBert for our encoder. And we also discuss how we collected Ruby type data and trained our similarity function. We also provide greater discussion of the benefits of SimTyper's approach, including the fact that the DeepSim network can actually predict types that weren't even in the training data and we provide many more evaluations that we haven't shown here. In conclusion, we set out with the goal of inferring usable type annotations for Ruby programs. Existing approaches to this problem, like constraint solving and heuristics, often fall short. So our solution was to introduce SimTyper, which uses a novel machine learning based approach called type equality prediction. And we believe this approach generalizes effectively to new programs, it incorporates natural language and program context information, and it enforces soundness of any inferred types. So we think this is an effective approach to this goal of type annotation inference. Thanks for listening.